look closer, drill deeper, and you will be surprised. This is taken from a film that my husband just finished on Whitman Brook. It's an orchard in Quiche. And as he was doing that film over the last two years, I was really working on this technique. And there were so many parallels that as you look really closely at things, you learn more, you can be innovative, and you can actually save some structures that are looking fairly old and as if you can't. So this is actually on carpal tunnel syndrome and trigger fingers. What is carpal tunnel? Carpal tunnel is tingling in the thumb, index, middle, and ring finger. It's the median nerve, which is the nerve in your wrist, in the center there, the yellow structure, that is under a ligament. Ligaments connect one bone to another, called the transverse carpal ligament. The symptoms, in addition to the numbness and tingling in the index, thumb, middle, and ring finger are sometimes burning pain going up your arm, especially at night. Often people dangle their arm over the side of the bed. Some people have a sense of swelling in their hand, and others feel weakness because this nerve provides the innervation to the thumb muscles right here, uh, which is involved in pinch. So I, I think of my practice in two parts. One is before I started using ultrasound, and the other is since using ultrasound for the last three years. Before I had the access to ultrasound, you would see your primary care physician. They would send you to me. I'd examine you clinically, take a history. Then I would send you out for electrical studies to see how compressed the nerve was. We'd bring you back in to go over those studies and decide if you needed surgery or an injection or if we could observe it. Since using carpal tunnel, I've employed two, since using ultrasound, excuse me, I've used two techniques to confirm your diagnosis. One is the carpal tunnel six questionnaire, which we'll go over, and the other is ultrasound itself. So the carpal tunnel six score, some of you may have it in front of you, it's sort of a variation on what I have up here on the screen is a validated questionnaire. And it, I'm gonna walk you through how you get the points. And you can see, are you someone who has carpal tunnel or not? So if you have numbness and tingling in your thumb index or middle finger, give yourself 3.5 points. If you have it at night, add four more. And if you look at your thumb and it looks a little flat over here, that's thenar atrophy, you get five more points. If you bend your wrist down and you hold it there for two or three minutes and that worsens the numbness and tingling in your hand, you get another five points. We're gonna skip the fifth one because that's a little more difficult to walk you through and go directly to the last one which is called the Tunnel sign when you tap over the nerve in the middle of the forearm. And if that sends a zing into your fingertips, you get four more points. If you scored more than 12, that's 80% accurate for carpal tunnel syndrome. If you scored more than 18, it's really accurate. It's 99%. What about ultrasound? So ultrasound is a painless way to assess carpal tunnel syndrome. It's very accurate. In fact, it's as good or better than the original nerve conduction studies that can be painful. It can be done on people who are on blood thinners or who have uh, 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 heart pacemakers. And it also allows us to understand whether or not you have one of the variations of the nerves. And that's really important when we're doing injections or surgery because we really don't want to hit an abnormal structure. So here's a slide of a ultrasound of the median nerve at the wrist. The nerve is labeled MN and the transverse carpal ligament is the structure in yellow. The big red thing is the ulnar artery, and the thumb is towards the left and the little finger towards the right. One of the things this slide shows is how the nerve changes shape from more proximal in the carpal tunnel to more distal. And if your nerve is less than 10, you don't have carpal tunnel. If it's greater than 10, that's abnormal. And the larger the nerve, 
the worse the compression. This is a close-up of the same area. And again, the transverse carpal ligament is in green, and the median nerve, MN, is the nerve that gets compressed. And the stripey structures underneath are all your flexor tendons. So what happens is you bend your fingers in and out, and it pushes up on the nerve, and the nerve pushes up into the ligament, and your hand goes numb. Ultrasound is great for showing us abnormalities to the nerve, and some of these are normal. About 20% of the people have nerves that are split. They're in two parts. And some of you even have an artery that normally goes away, but it persists. We don't want to hit that artery at surgery, and we certainly don't want to hit one of the smaller branches. The other thing it does is, as Jay Smith, who's one of the founders of Sonics, has said, it makes us safer surgeons. We can actually see the nerve in three dimensions. It's actually the only way we can do that in the clinic and in the operating room. This slide is showing the thenar motor branch. It's the part that goes to the thumb muscles. And early in my career, a friend who's a very good neurosurgeon cut that nerve, and I had to do a tendon transfer for the patient. So it's something, believe it or not, when we're doing an open procedure, we actually don't usually see it. We only see it if it's coming in an abnormal way. And the same is true for the endoscopic carpal tunnel, which I'll go over. So how accurate is ultrasound? It's really accurate. It's 89% sensitive, meaning that it confirms that you have carpal tunnel. It's also really accurate for saying if you don't have carpal tunnel, it's 90% accurate. And that's actually better than nerve conduction studies. They have a 20% false positive rate, which means that the test is positive, but you don't have carpal tunnel. I had thought through, and I thought I was being innovative on this, and I wasn't, as you can see by this slide, of combining the carpal tunnel 6 score and ultrasound. It seemed to me that having two ways to confirm that you have carpal tunnel was better than one. But John Fowler, who is a hand surgeon who's very well published on ultrasound and carpal tunnel syndrome, published this paper in the Journal of Hand Surgery in 2021 that showed if you combine those two tests, it is the most cost-effective solution to reducing delays in surgical care. You save, he saved 1.8 medical visits. I don't know what an eighth of a medical, 0.8 of a medical visit is. Um, hopefully they're full. For me, it's been much more. It's about two visits. And we get people to surgery faster, about a month. It also eliminated the nerve conduction study, which is 45% of the cost of the preoperative workup. So how do we treat carpal tunnel? Well, if the nerve cross-sectional area on ultrasound is less than 10, you can wear a brace at night or we can inject. The thing I would say is if you have it in both hands, it's always good to make sure there isn't another reason why your nerve isn't working well. And thyroid disease, diabetes, a B12 deficiency are the top three. And those are so easy to check and you'll feel better if we correct them. When the nerve is uh, greater than 10, especially when it starts getting into that 14 and 15 area, surgery is indicated. And no matter how you do a carpal tunnel release, whether it's open or endoscopic or via ultrasound, you're releasing a ligament to make more room for the nerve. And really what you wanna do is just not damage the nerve, muscles, or the overlying tissue. So for 80% of all carpal tunnels done in the United States, and there are about 500,000 of them done per year. It's a very common procedure. The vast majority are done as an open technique, meaning we make an incision in your palm. We cut down through the skin, through the fat, through the fascia, which is a shiny coating over muscles, sometimes through muscle. And that gets us down to the ligament that we actually have to release to take the pressure off the nerve. The endoscopic procedure is about 30% of all carpal tunnels, and it is done by placing a camera in the wrist. And the incision is sometimes in the forearm and sometimes in the hand. The field of view is limited. You establish where you're going to start the cut for the carpal tunnel ligament release by palpation. Um, 
the recovery is faster than for the open technique. It's listed as two to four weeks, whereas for an open carpal tunnel, classically, it's four to six weeks before you regain your strength and the incision feels better. So what about ultrasound? The incision is five millimeters in size. It's in the forearm area, so it heals very nicely. Most patients are back to normal activities in three days and heavy lifting within seven to 10 days. It can be done under local only anesthesia. That's huge. It, most people don't need any pain meds other than ibuprofen or Tylenol. And you don't need occupational therapy because the scarring in the palm doesn't happen. So this slide shows the comparison of all three techniques. The ultra guide knife or under, carp, uh, under ultrasound is on the far left. The endoscopic, which is the camera in the wrist, is in the middle and the open on the far right. And what you can see is the ultra guide shows the best visualization of the nerve, the fastest recovery through the smallest incision. So how is this achieved? The ultra guide knife, and I actually have one right there if people want to actually play around with it, just don't cut yourself on the knife part. Um, is very, very well designed. It matches the configuration of the carpal canal. There's a safety tip right here that is plastic and it protects this little blade. And that blade cannot be put up unless safety balloons are inflated. Once we know it's in the correct position, we can just slide it with one thumb along the carpal tunnel, easily releasing it. And then once we're done, you can retract the blade so you're not gonna cut anything and remove the device. This is the first view that we see uh, at the time of surgery. Again, it's, it, it, we have the ultrasound to map out the nerve and mark out safe zones between really critical structures like the nerve to the left and the artery to the right on the short axis view. And then we're looking in the long length of the transverse carpal ligament, which is right here. We don't want to hit the superficial arch, which is a major artery. And once you have mapped out the nerve and numbed up the hand, you make a small incision, again, five millimeters in the forearm right here under ultrasound guidance and place a small probe underneath the ligament to make sure that you free up any tissues that are underneath the ligament. It also lets you see if you have space between the nerve and the artery again. And once you have a nice space, you place the device and you inflate the balloons. So the ligament is the structure on the top and the tip of the device is the white part pressing up. And we confirm that the device is in the right position in two planes, making sure that the nerve is to the left and that there is nothing between the, the device and the ligament. And when you're sure, you bring the blade up, and you watch that blade under ultrasound as you move it through the ligament, releasing the ligament to make more room for the nerve. Sonix has maintained a database on 15,000 procedures. It started in 2017, and they follow these patients by sending out a text message every day for the first couple of weeks. And what they found was that patient, patients returned to their normal activities very quickly. The average was three days. They were returning to work within five days, including if it was heavy lifting. And as we said before, it was Tylenol and uh, Motrin for pain. And there have been multiple studies, nine peer-reviewed studies, which means they're published in recognized medical journals, and 20 podium presentations at the American Society for Surgery of the Hand, as well as the American Association for Surgery of the Hand, and some of the sports medicine organizations. This paper, I think, is one of their best. It came out in 2022. One of the things I love about it, it is multi-center, meaning many places, and it's pragmatic, it's practical. That's great, that's exactly what patients want. You want something that is reproducible and practical. It confirmed what the company had said was that people return to normal activities in three days and work in five. 
it was consistent regardless of the type of patient that it was used on. So if you smoked or were diabetic, uh, if you had a high bo body mass index or multiple medical problems, this device worked equally well. And actually, there's no other device that really can say that. So why Sonex? Why did I choose, choose it? I was 24 years into my career, and I had done open carpal tunnels for 24 years, and I do about 100 a year. Um, the reason I chose it is the attention to detail. The knife is incredibly well made. The physicians who designed it have thought out everything, every step from diagnosis to using it in the operating room. And it has made things simple, safe, and very precise. The training was more extensive than for any other device I've used in orthopedics. And I've used total wrist arthroplasties, I've used plates and screws, but this was the most precise. We could do courses online or in person, and the company provided support in the clinic and the operating room to make sure that I was mapping the nerve correctly and that I was using the device safely and correctly in the operating room. The other thing I like is that there is a continued commitment to perfecting the device and maintaining a database. And we really want that. We want to know that what we think we're doing and achieving, that we really are. And the next study that they're doing is a uh, randomized level one trial based uh, with the primary investigator out of Mass General comparing open carpal tunnel release to this device. The founders, Jay Smith and Daryl Barnes, are leaders in the field of musculoskeletal ultrasound. They are incredibly well published. They have 100 articles just on musculoskeletal ultrasound alone, and they've done the core curriculum that's used for sports medicine fellows as well as physiatrists. It was truly the best designed educational platform I've used. What's it allowed us to do? What, what have we achieved by changing to this technique? First and foremost, we have very happy patients. And in addition, we have really happy staff, both in the clinic and the operating room. Uh, we've been able to redesign our whole process and in a time when you're short staffed and short of supplies, this means a lot. We've eliminated EKGs and pre-op physicals and labs if you have it under local only. You can eat up until the procedure. You can leave your underwear on. I spent 12 years trying to get that through. <laughs> who would guess? It's a shorter procedure. It's, so the people who are waiting for you don't have to wait as long. Uh, we can do it on people who have medical conditions that we can't now put to sleep under anesthesia. COVID really changed a lot of the parameters for general anesthesia at APD. And to be able to do local only for people who have medical conditions is such a relief. There are no sutures. So you're not coming back in to have the sutures taken out, which can be uncomfortable. And sometimes, as some of you know, those sutures can reappear later on, or you can end up with a scar that feels thickened. So there's no need for occupational therapy. I think APD is the perfect fit for the Ultra Guide. I've been here for 24 years, and there's some defining characteristics, I think, of the APD staff. They love innovation. They love a procedure that takes some of the silly issues that we deal with and removes them. They also love things that don't waste supplies. And uh, I'm about to show you in this slide, the setup on the right was what we did for an open carpal tunnel. There were 43 instruments. A huge bag of garbage was generated at the end of the case. On the left is what we're doing now. We're using four instruments. I do about nine cases a day. So if you do the math, there are about 357 instruments that were being cleaned and processed, but never touched. That's a huge waste. This is the hand of one of my patients who had the Ultra Guide carpal tunnel release and two Ultra Guide trigger finger releases. Um, and in case you can't see them, and I can't see it with my glasses on from here because they're readers, the carpal tunnel incision is actually 
let's see if I can do this, here, and the trigger finger incisions are here. Sorry. So our Sonics experience right now, we're 213 cases in. Uh, we have also done 63 trigger fingers, and we've more than doubled the number of patients who are electing to have the surgery done under local only. This is the map of sort of Philadelphia up of uh, Sonics users when I completed my certification. And by the way, we do have certifications that we have to meet in order to be allowed to use this device. I think that's also a really good thing. And I finished in March of 2022, and here it is now. So this technique is really gaining uh, across the United States, and it's my guess that because of its safety profile, because it is such a rapid recovery and a small incision, that it's gonna become the standard of care. What we need to do is just train the hand surgeons in how to use ultrasound. I have many people to thank. It's been a um, labor of love to bring this on. Dr. Jay Smith and Daryl Barnes have been amazing colleagues to me. They have answered multiple emails. I think I've asked them just about any question you can think of. Colleen Smith and TJ McCaslin, who's here, has been uh, just an amazing support. During COVID, as you might well imagine, we would have a list of people up for surgery but then someone might get exposed to COVID or get COVID, and so they'd be taken off the surgical list. And we had to change flights and who came in to help in the operating room, and they were always accommodating and very helpful. Amy, Patty, Joan, and Kathy are the ultrasonographers employed by Sonics who fine-tuned our ultrasound machine so I could see your nerves better and provided just quiet, competent support in the operating room for the first 30 procedures. My staff and my administrators uh, in the clinic and in the operating room, these guys, once they saw this device and they saw how well the patients did, the, especially the first 30 patients, they were right on board and they changed our entire processes and have made it just a joy. I, I think one of the happiest moments for me was when Don Rafis, who is my nurse of 24 years, walked down the hall after we had done our first seven or eight of these, and she's just smiling and laughing and saying, Diane, they're doing so well. She just couldn't believe it and um, still is delighted each time the patients come in to see how well they're doing. And I'm happy to say the trigger finger device that they designed is equally good. Our surgical schedulers have been phenomenal. Uh, if you see tape burn under my eyes, that's because we've been able to put these cases in little spots that have opened up in the operating room and get your cases on and done in a far more timely fashion because they're shorter. And the, and the set surgical schedulers are doing their level best to try to get you on at a convenient time for you. Dale Vidal and Peter Lozier are two physicians here, and Dale looked at me at one point in this process and said, I, I really admire you for changing something you've done the same way for 24 years. It takes courage. I hadn't really thought about it that way, um, but I have to say it was nerve-wracking to change. I don't feel that way now. I'm, I'm more nervous giving this presentation today than I am doing your surgery. Um, and I really want to thank my patients what an amazing group of people. Our first 30 patients were actually a trial to see if I liked the device and whether or not the institution liked the device. But the patients did so well. They were so happy. Some had had an open on one side, and this was the second side. Or they had an endoscopic carpal tunnel release on one side, and they were coming in for their other side. And it was so much faster, so much easier on them to recover and get back to their life, and they didn't need OT nor therapy, that they put up Facebook posts, they wrote letters to the administration and called in and expressed their gratitude. And many of them, most of them, did it so that you could have it. I thought that was incredible. They didn't have another hand to do. They were just speaking up because they were thrilled, and they wanted to make sure other patients could have the same thing. 
So I'll end this part with a quote from Henry Mayo, and it's probably bad form to have something that was designed by Mayo Clinic physicians and cut off Henry Mayo's name. Sorry about that. But I think he's right. And I think Dartmouth also trained me to believe the very same thing, which is the best interest of the patient is the only pa thing to consider. You're why we do what we do. There is no question about that. And changing to make things better for you, as my first practice manager says, and I know my, my present one does as well, if we take care of you, things will take care of themselves. So that's my part on carpal tunnel, and I'm happy to address questions at this point. I have about seven slides on trigger fingers if you're interested, but we can stop now if that's what you would prefer. Any questions? So I know some of you already know what a trigger finger is, but um, <laughs> for those who don't, and hopefully you'll never have to know, uh, a trigger finger is a tendon now. So we were talking about a nerve getting trapped under a ligament. Now we're gonna talk about a tendon getting trapped under a ligament or a pulley. Medicine is full of changing names of things. It's really the same kind of structure. It's a fascial thickening, but in the palm, it's called a pulley, and in the wrist, we call it a ligament. And it's like having a knot in a shoelace. When you bend your finger down, it snaps or locks, and then you have to work to straighten the finger out, and it hurts. This is the ultrasound of it. It's really clear. It's, uh, you can see the bone is the white structure here. This is your flexor tendons or the things that bend your finger in and out. And the pulley system is, this is the A1 pulley. This is the A0 pulley, which I have to know about, but hopefully you don't. And the skin is on the top. So we're looking this way, all right? So, if it's not too bad and you've had it for a short period of time, the steroid injections help, but sometimes they don't solve it. Splinting at night, because believe it or not, some of you clench, and I'm sure during COVID, more of us clenched. Hopefully as COVID abates, less of us will clench, but that's, it, it is true that some people curl up when they sleep and that makes it worse. There's a splint called the Active Innovation Splint. This was something one of my patients showed me. Her daughter was an OT in Boston. It looks like it shouldn't do anything, but it actually blocks you from making a really tight fist, and it, and it can help the really hard locking. And when none of that works, we can do surgery. And there are a variety of techniques for trigger finger releases, just like for carpal tunnel. Most are done open, and the incisions can be straight down, across, or in the crease. And I will tell you that I think most of us think that this is easy peasy and you're all going to do well and that there aren't any issues. And I would say from an infection or hitting a nerve, yeah, that's absolutely true. But one of the things that has come forward, especially during COVID, is that there are about 20 percent of the people who have trigger finger releases that have a longer recovery. They have more scarring. They may get Dupuytrens, which is that scar tissue, gnarly stuff in your palm. And the longer the trigger finger has existed, the more injections you've had, the longer the recovery from especially an open technique. And that was published by uh, the Hospital for Special Surgery in 2021. It was called the advanced tr trigger finger. There have been studies that have looked at ultrasound guided trigger finger releases uh, versus open. And what they found, just like with the carpal tunnel, you heal faster. We're not cutting as many structures, so there's less scarring, and you can move the hand right away. So this is what Sonics came up with. It's a sled or that can slide underneath the pulley. And when you're in the right place, and I don't know if that device got around, but we can... I just want to caution them just because it really does go off the post very easy and I don't want anyone to cut themselves. So I'll repeat that. Yeah. So um, you're gonna see that it comes off the post, the little knife blade as we pass it around and please don't cut yourself, okay? But. I'll start with Omar. Omar has kept me in business for a long time. 
But it's a very simple device. It's very thin. It's the thinnest thing that we've had to release trigger fingers. And this little tiny blade, just like you had pointed out for the carpal tunnel, can be moved up and cut the pulley. So here's a picture in the operating room with the ultrasound again going the whole time, the device in your other hand. And if you look carefully, here's your... Whoa, okay. These are the tendons, this is the pulley, and the white line is the device. So it slides right underneath the pulley that has thickened. You check it in two planes. You always want to make sure you're in the right place. And the big white line is the device that's going around. And when you're in the right place, a little white dot can be flicked up. That's the blade. The blade sort of reflects the light of the ultrasound. And you just slide it through the ligament, releasing it so the tendons will have more room to glide. This device came out in March of 2022, so it's a year old and they've already published a few papers on it. This is one of the papers that was published last February, presented, something like that, uh, on 164 fingers. And what they found was, again, everybody did really well. Within three days, they're back to normal activities, and they were back to work in seven days. I have to tell you, the people who have had an open trigger finger, and then they've had this, it's just night and day. They're almost giddy. It is so fast and so easy. There are no sutures. It's a three millimeter incision. It's tiny. It's only enough to get that device under the skin. This is one of my patients. She actually had had both sides done and that's her at a week out from surgery, her hand and then her motion. And this was her coming in. We did them two weeks, a, a week apart. This was her coming in for her other side. These are her two incisions from the week before. They've totally healed. She has full range of motion. She didn't take anything more than Tylenol or Advil for pain. Um, so another person who you're going to know, Omar, uh, I ran into Dr. Ron Green. He's a psychiatrist in Hanover. He's 80, and he's still practicing and loving medicine. And we were talking about being in medicine, and he was saying that the diagnosis of depression is actually being uh, advanced at Stanford by using imaging, uh, MRI, and that they can now be more precise and identify it and do a very expensive, a $40,000 procedure to get rid of depression by stimulating area 25. And I said, well, that's really interesting because the field of hand surgery is advancing because we can now use ultrasound to be more precise and do smaller incisions. And he said, well, I'm gonna send you a poem. And so this is from, uh, this is a poem by Emily Dickinson. And I think it's pretty apt. Surgeons must be very careful when they take the knife. Underneath their fine incisions stirs the culprit life. And I think what's true about this is when we operate, we want to do what we really need to do for you to help get rid of the numbness or tingling or let the, the fingers glide better, but we don't need to create havoc. We don't want to have a prolonged recovery that requires a lot of medication. And so we, when we choose things very carefully and design them well, I think we can achieve that. So that's all I have. Well, thank you so much for coming. I hope this was of help. And uh, if we can help you, please let us know.